All right, we just played Everything You Know Is Wrong by Chumbawamba. Yes, they have songs other than Tub Thumping that are worth listening to. Turn to Stone by Electric Light Orchestra. And <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Let me clear my throat. I, I, I don't know. I apologize for this. I should have this stuff set before, ready before I talk. And we ended with Rainbow and Curved Air by Terry Riley, which I unfortunately had to cut short. Not that it matters, because the managers would hang me if I played all 18 minutes of it. Can't afford to take up all that precious time that we could spend playing crappy alternative rock and electronica. But I digress. Now, we have a very exciting portion of the program. An interview, provided all this Skype stuff checks out. And I apologize in advance if the, the service does not work or whatever, and we're not able to make the call, but... Not to worry because I have, like I said before, a backup plan. So the show will go. The show will go on. It must go on. Yeah. So don't worry about it. And what's it called? Let's ho- let's pray to pray with me that it works fine. And let's speak it. All right. And here we go. This thing had to be brought to a logical conclusion at some point. We never fired On February 28th, 1993, ATF agents stormed the Branch Divian compound outside of Waco, Texas, over alleged violations of federal gun law. A firefight ensued, and a two-month-long siege commenced, finally ending on April 19th, when the FBI assaulted the compound with a tank that poured tear gas into the building. A fire broke out and destroyed the compound, killing 76 Davidians. Many questions hung over the incident, culminating in 1997's documentary Emmy-winning Waco, The Rules of Engagement, directed by William Gazeki, who we are proud to speak to today. In addition, he edited The Vanishing of the Bees, produced music albums for Bette Midler and the Doors, and in 2009 was invited to join the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Currently, he is directing and producing another documentary, this time about jazz singer radio personality, and vaudeville performer Sophie Tucker. And let's make the call and hope it works out. Ringing, ringing, ringing. Hello, Mr. Gazeki. Hi there. Hello, Mr. Gazeki. It's, it's an honor to have you on our show today. Thank you. What's that called? Okay, so what inspired you to make the film in the first place? Uh, Waco, the rules of engagement. Mm-hmm. Well, I got a telephone call one day in the spring of 1995. And the phone call that I got was from a man by the name of Michael McNulty. Mm-hmm. And Michael McNulty, turns out, was a friend of a friend of mine who was a movie producer. Mm-hmm. And that man's name was Aaron Russo. Mm-hmm. Aaron Russo is known now for films like America, Freedom to Fascism. And Aaron was an old friend of mine from the movie-making days, my movie-making days, and and his as well. And Michael came over to my editing room and showed me a videotape that was shot the day the Waco compound burned down. And it was a surveillance tape that was shot from an airplane flying about 10,000 feet. And it was an infrared tape, an overview of the entire day that the place burned down. And it showed stuff that the news media never saw. It showed things that nobody had ever seen, one of which was a tank that was sent to the back of the building and started running into the building and, and, and running it over and basically terrorizing the people inside the building to try supposedly to try and get them to come out. And he showed me this tape and I thought, this is so off the hook. I'd never seen anything like it. It was terrifying, quite frankly. And so I agreed to help him out, and I wrote him a proposal, a one-page proposal, a two-page proposal. And lo and behold, within about a week, he had secured the money to make the film, and we went to work. What's it called? Wow, that's, that's what's it called? Interesting. And you're right about that footage, because I had never seen that footage of the tank going, like, I always see the footage of, like, the tank going, make it, 
charge you the front of the building, but I had never seen it go around and like attack the back. So that's yes. that is really interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. No. You're not supposed to do that. In a law enforcement situation, it's generally not recommended to take a tank and run a building over. Oh yeah. <laughs> what's the call? I, I what's the call? I think most people would agree about that, but. I don't know why they seemed fine with it when this when it happened this time. I I really don't know why. Well, so um, uh, did you have any idea that the film would be as well received as it was? Absolutely not. I. Mr. Gazeki. Shoot! Oh goodness! I I'm so sorry. We're having. Why is it not working? I'm so sorry. We're having some technical difficulties. What's it called? But I. What's it called? Please bear with us. This is. I, I'm so sorry about this. I should. What's it called? But if it does not work out, we will. Oh, here we go. Turn your, yeah, turn your video off. Oh, goodness. Oh. Sorry about that. I, I, <laughs> this is okay. Anyway, so. Um, no, I had spent about a year in the editing room working on that film. And this was back in the days when everything was on tape. Mm -hmm. We didn't have nonlinear editing, though. There was no avid or uh, Final Cut Pro or anything like that. Um, and so I spent about a year or so in the editing room, pretty much by myself, on the telephone with Mr. McNulty quite a bit. He lived in Colorado. And by the time I was done, I had no idea what I had. I was hoping it would be understandable. That was about as far as I could take it. I was hoping people would look at it and go, and not say, why, this is just a bunch of non sequiturs. <laughs> So that no, I had no idea it would be accepted. I we nobody did. Um, when we got into Sundance, we were thrilled because uh, that's where it premiered, and we got nominated for an Academy Award. We were equally as com just completely floored. What's it, what's it called? well, it does stand out from other what's it called um uh, documentaries of this nature. Like a lot of them, they seem very like they're very uh, conspiratorial minded and um, uh, kind of almost you, some people call them paranoid but this is very um, uh, your film was very um, uh, it it was like it seemed very rash cogent very um, uh, rational and it was like asking questions based on like things that actually happened you know it wasn't like extrapolating it was just like well how do you explain this so I think that really helped the film make its case well thank you that's you know Dr. No that's very that's very thoughtful of you to, to be aware of that I, I was not aware of it <laughs> myself. Yeah. So you know, I think that's you know, I think it's a, a, a matter of first of all, the team that made the film. I made the film as a filmmaker. You know, I did the mm -hmm. the shooting and the editing, but re really, it was it was it was it was nurtured by three of us, and we each brought to the process a different kind of sensibility. Mister McNulty was passionate. He's a Mormon. He took tremendous offense to all of the religious elements that are within the story. Dan Gifford, the executive producer, uh, is a pragmatist, very practical guy, and very much aware of constitutional issues mm -hmm. and the impact that Waco had, or the degree to which the Waco situation challenged some of the rights that we um, uh, 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 are given or provided by our constitution. And how those rights were, you know, basically thrown out the window. And my job was more, you know, really a storyteller, a technician, a storyteller. Um, you know, I brought a, a certain storytelling sensibility to it. And one thing that I did put my feet down for, because McNulty had all kinds of ideas and stories, not really conspiratorial, but some of it bordered on conjecture. Mm -hmm. And I knew that we had a hot potato in our hands. And one thing that I said to him during the post-production was, if I don't have two photos of it, it's not in the movie. Mm, You've got to have photographic evidence or we do not even talk about it. And I think that made a big difference. I think between that and Dan Gifford's sensible approach to these, practical approach to these things, uh, kept us on the straight and narrow to a great degree. Yeah, yeah, it looks like, and it looks like it paid off. I mean, like, I mean, I read Roger Ebert's review of the film, and he gave it like he gave it a stamp of his approval. And he's like, he's a huge skeptic, you know. Like he's very like, what's it, like outside of movies, he's like, I need to see evidence for this. He he was a humanist, and so I think like if you impressed him, I think that's a that's a what's it called? Yeah. A, that's a very um, a, that's like a huge endorsement, if you ask me. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, 
Mr. Eber was a very special guy and knew what, knew what, he, was, knew what he was doing, too. So, no, I, I, I feel quite honored myself by that. And it's a milestone in my life as well. Oh, yeah. So, and what's it called? It's funny when you talk about the siege, like the, the siege and everything, like, because, like, if you say anything remotely critical of the ATF, people will take this as you endorsing everything David Koresh or his followers said and did. Like, and this happens with Ruby Ridge, too. Like, you can't yeah. argue that law enforcement acted unreasonably without being called a white separatist because Randy yes. Weaver was a white separatist and only a white separatist would defend him, you know? Like, have, have you had to fend off such criticism and explain that you could defend a person's right to not have their home stormed with a tank and filled with gas without endorsing their religious or political beliefs? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I have. You know, it's, it's... I think things have changed some, though, since the film came out, but quite mm. frankly. I think that, that the impact of 9-11 on sort of the, I don't know what you call it, the mass consciousness or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. public sentiment, however you want to put it. Mm-hmm. I think people are less open-minded and more afraid and less tolerant of things they don't know much about. And I think that in terms of, uh, you know, talking about Waco and, and Koresh and all that, I think that we have to look back, we have to go back, throw the line way back to the founding of this country. Mm-hmm. You know, the people who founded the United States of America were considered terrorists by the oh, British. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we have to remember what our roots are and what, what you know, it's all, it all gets down to values. It gets down to ethics and values. And, uh, you know, the rest of it is just a bunch of, a bunch of you know, hyped up TV news, as far as I'm mm-hmm. concerned. Mm-hmm. And irresponsible to a certain degree at that. Yeah, it's it, what's it called? It yeah, it's interesting to bring up how it's, times have changed because like I watched the your film for the first time in the wake of the Chris Dorner manhunt here in L.A. back like in February. You see, right. like when the cabin right. he was holed up and caught fire. I couldn't help being reminded of Waco, so uh, that's that's what motivated me to check your movie out. You know, do you feel so? Do you feel what we learned at Waco, if anything, is still relevant today, or has it changed too much then? Well, here's what I think. I think that law enforcement in general is a culture of its own. Mm -hmm. Perhaps more than is good for us or or even itself. And I think that uh, this fellow, uh, was it Dorn? Dorn, Dornan? Dorner? Chris Dorner, yeah. Dorner, yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, I read some of his manifesto and when that was going on... um, Mm -hmm. You know, I I, re- I I managed to call a, a little bit of information about, you know, where he was coming from, and I could only imagine that. Here's what I saw with Waco, and I thought saw the same with the Dorner, basically, mm-hmm. and that is when, you know, law enforcement has is in a very tough position in many ways. They're 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 betwixt and between between a rock and a hard place in a lot of different ways, mm-hmm. but being that as it may, they still have a job to do, and that's the job they pick. And they select it in their lives. Mm-hmm. The problem with law enforcement is it has a tendency to almost cultify itself. You know, I worked on another film. I made another film called Reckless Indifference. Mm-hmm. Reckless Indifference is the story of a murder trial that took place in Malibu on a case that originated out of Agoura Hills in 1995, I believe it originally mm-hmm. occurred. And... Um, there, also, law enforcement uh, took a few matters into it, into their own hands, as did the justice system. And what I'm really trying to get at is, in Waco, in the Waco film that I made, there is a scene where you have this guy standing on a tank or standing by an SUV saying, you know, born to kill. Mm-hmm. I'm law enforcement, and I am born to kill. I am honed to the bone, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's part of an attitudinal thing that I think is a real big issue especially when you start taking people from the military and putting them into law enforcement. Because, you know, the military's job is to go kill the enemy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not law enforcement's job. Law enforcement's job is to assist in the justice process, okay, mm-hmm. to serve and defend or whatever, whatever it is they ride on their cars. And the problem with law enforcement, and I saw this in Reckless Indifference, I saw it in Waco. Boy, did I receive in Waco with regard to the FBI's protective attitude towards the ATF. Mm. And that is that law enforcement likes revenge. Mm -hmm. When a man is killed in the line of duty, his brothers, his law enforcement associates, have a sort of unwritten law that they are going to extract some revenge 
from somebody. If they can find them, they're gonna you know, they're, they're gonna get their their quart of blood or their you know whatever out you call flesh. it out, out of flesh <laughs> yeah. exactly. And that is an un, and my understanding is that's an unwritten law in law enforcement is that when a man is killed in the line of duty, no matter what happens, you get to the bottom of it, whatever that happens to mean, and however it needs to happen. And I think that's really quite true across the board in all levels of law enforcement, and I think that it should be examined a little more carefully. Yeah, yeah, and that was this, what you just said was very apparent in Waco, like, in your film, you tried to portray both sides very fairly, but people, like, some people on the side of the feds, they came across really, really bad, like, like, you had Tom Lantos, like, completely demagoguing the issue at the beginning of the film, saying it was uh -huh. completely the, the Davidians' fault, law enforcement did not do anything bad at all, then you had Chuck Schumer, like, Bully, virtually bullying people testifying against the FBI and Congress saying like yeah. flash bang, oh, yeah. flash bangs aren't grenades they're, they're not grenades they're not dangerous it's just like were you surprised by like how they were acting about it like when you made, were making the film you know you know that was my first exposure to that level of politics quite frankly I'd never seen anything. you know my first day on the job was in Washington DC mm -hmm. we, we, we we got into production just as they were commencing 14 days of uh, hearings in the House of Representatives which is where the Lantos and Schumer material is from. Mm. 14 days of hearings on the Waco matter. And it was very interesting. You know, we went we went to D.C. I went with my camera. I went with Mr. McNulty. We went expecting to get interviews, like with the ATF people mm -hmm. and the FBI. You know, people that were involved that would, you know, uh, appreciate participating in a fair documentary, fair-minded documentary. Let me tell you, these guys... <laughs> It was such a trip. Every time these guys, first of all, they wouldn't even talk to us, okay, because we were not NBC, ABC, or CBS, or any or CNN, or any major network. Thus, we offered no political advantage to them whatsoever. The only interviews we got in Washington, D.C. were a couple of Branch Davidians, mm. and they were very touching interviews. Mm -hmm. But the big boys wouldn't talk to us because we weren't one of their clique. But what was really interesting was how they behaved outside of the hearing room. They were high-fiving each other. They were slapping each other on the back. They were like, good job, man, good job. And what I saw was a bunch of politicization of the justice process. These guys are supposed to be there testifying under oath. And I got the general impression that they were there as spinmeisters for their respective divisions or, you know, uh, FBI, DE, whatever, you know, whatever organization they happen to be employed by. They were there to protect their turf. They were not necessarily there only to tell the truth. And I looked at that as a newbie, man. I was the, that was my first day on the job. I saw this stuff, and I just thought, holy crap, this is crazy. And I'll never forget that. I will never forget my new impressions of how, you know, the power structures of the world really work. Yeah, it's funny. I felt exactly like that when I saw the, the Schumer exchange between him and the, I, I don't remember the, the, the person's name but they were talking about the flash banks i felt exactly like that i was just like i had never heard of Schum chuck schumer before i didn't know he was a senator and i was just like so put off by like how like just vit vitriolic he was and like it just out <laughs> to get the davidians you know yes well senator schumer obviously has developed his skills because he's still around oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah no i was a little amazed too now here's the thing about that whole deal was that all this happened when clinton was brand new as president Okay, mm -hmm. the first Democratic president in 12 years. Mm -hmm. He's not in office more than three months, and, and Waco blows up. Okay, mm -hmm. so everybody in charge, all the ATF people and all the FBI people, were all from the Reagan Bush era. Mm -hmm. None of them were Clinton appointees, none of them worked under Clinton's bureaucratic aegis. So, Mr. Clinton, President Clinton, was between a rock and a hard place himself. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the problems with Waco in general, politically, was, Mr. President, why can't you get these religious fanatics or, or nuts out of their own house? You're the President of the United States. And Clinton was faced with that, and it was, I'm sure, one of his, one of his early challenges was in trying to figure out how to deal with the situation politically, let alone in terms of justice. Especially when you've got the FBI down there with their pecking order and their agendas and the ATF and the whole nine yards. I mean, you know, so the problem was the Democrats, when it got to the hearings, 
were there primarily to protect the president and the part in the Democratic Party. So the Democrats took the role the Republicans usually take. The Democrats were the law enforcement. Um, they were the law enforcement, uh, you know, sort of supporter. Mm -hmm. And the Republicans were out to vilify law enforcement because they were trying to get a Clinton. Mm -hmm, yeah. So the political roles were switched from what they normally are. Normally the Republicans are the law enforcement supporters, and the Democrats are the ones who are a little critical and want mm -hmm. to look at policy and, you know, see what else can be done and blah, 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 blah. And in this instance, the roles were reversed. And they pulled a lot of shenanigans. You know, the Justice Department delivered apparently something like three pallets of documents, three pallets of paper to the congressional hearing offices without a single index or appendix. These guys, these congressmen and their aides had something like 15,000 pages of documents to go through to, to get ready for these hearings and no index. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, the, st the stuff that goes on back there is unbelievable. Un unbelievable. Yeah, and what's it called? You're completely right about like how the roles were reversed. You know, like I mean, it was just it's really crazy to look back. And then like during the Bush years, the what's it called? The Republicans were once again def defenders of law enforcement and like the government. Oh, yeah. You know, and now sure. now they're they're anti-government again because the Democrat is in the White House. So it's it's really it's kind of funny to see. Kind of sad too, actually. Well, it's one of the things that made the whole thing I think difficult. For example, for, for the uh, the news networks to wrap their heads around. Mm. You know, news networks want an easy target. Mm, that's very true. If they want a sexy bad guy that they can, you know, that they can string up in about four sound bites. What's oh, um, I have one more question about the hearing, and I and if if you if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask some more about um your career outside of the Waco, the rules of engagement. So, sure. Um, sure. To my understanding, there's still a lot of like controversy about where bl like ultimate blame for the use of the CS gas against the Davidians falls and what's it called i've heard that janet reno was ultimately responsible for that decision but i've also heard that fbi agents like on the ground like they misrepresented the situation to her and kind of making her a dupe in a way and then i've heard bill clinton himself approve the gas after reno asked for it do you like do you think Eddie? i think that i think this entire argument is a bit of what they call a red herring mm. or just dis or distraction okay mm -hmm. cs 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 gas was used in the tanks that's real clear mm-hmm it's toxic. It's poisonous. There were, you know, I don't know what, 60 kids inside of that building. You know, like the morals, whatever it was, yeah. the, ethics and morals, <laughs> the ethics and morals around this, you know, are a conversation that a child could figure out. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to know more about is how many military people were there the day the place burned down. Mm -hmm. My understanding, according to Mr. McNulty's further um, research, is that there were people in the vicinity uh, armed with live ammunition who were a part of the army. Mm. Now, when the place burned down, that's what is known as a law enforcement action. According to our laws, one in particular called the Posse Comitatus Act, the military is not supposed to be involved in any law enforcement actions at all. Well, apparently somebody decided that that wasn't really the way they wanted this thing to roll. So my understanding is there were some um, specialists there special army mm -hmm. folks with guns in operation when the place was under siege and burning down on that last day. I'd like to know who approved that and how they got there and, and you know, what, that's, what that little ditty is about because nobody's looking at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's like, yeah, you're right about that. Like, they're, they're, if you ask, they're like, oh, they were just advisors. They were just watching, you know, and what's that called? But, yeah, like, I mean, I, the the infrared footage what was that the heat like the footage i showed the heat like it showed yeah. the people yeah. like as the tanks going in and show like like what looked like shots like you said like the movie said like, no, no. you know the, the, it's pretty clear you know dr allard who invented this equipment part of the development team of this infrared equipment which by the way the fbi had no idea what it even showed today they would but in the, back in those days the fbi didn't use infrared mm -hmm. which is why it became publicly available and why we were able to see the automatic weapons fire mm -hmm. outside of the building as it was burning, which most people pretty much assume was not the Branch Davidians. Mm, yeah. And you know, and this whole affair, this whole situation, this you know, the government has never once 
tried to contradict the rules of engagement. There has never been a single government statement that has ever come out about this film being inaccurate, biased, or in any way improperly put together. Yeah, and what's it called? You're right about that. Like I've, I have yet to see any criticism of the film. So like, well, like, I mean, any legitimate criticism. You know, like everybody. It's just kind of ignored now by people who are pro, you know, who are pro ATF, pro FBI in that incident, you know? How much time have you got left? Um, I got like five minutes left, so. Right. Well, I, I might be able to go a little bit, but I'll ask you like just two um, short questions. Um, well, it's yeah. like, so um, uh, I, I read that you produced two albums with Paul Rothschild for The Doors, Alive She Cried, and Greatest Hits Volume 2. Can you tell us about that experience? Sure. Paul was a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. He was. Um, a very well, part of a really small handful of people that were, you know, really extremely important to my career development. He was a mentor of mine, mm. and I valued him. His his uh, I valued the time that I worked with him tremendously. He was uh, you know uh, um, uh, you know in this world we have um, apprentices, journeymen, and master craftsmen. And Paul was a master craftsman. Mm -hmm. He was a master record producer. He was also a record producer not just a glorified recording engineer or, or somebody who just, you know, documented sound. He actually made records, meaning he put together the elements of a song and a performer in such a manner that people would enjoy listening to his, his what he did forever. And that's what he tried to teach me. He tried to teach me what timeless creativity, the output of, you know, the, the, what timeless products are. Hmm. And the, the Rose is a, also something that I did with Paul, uh, with Bette Midler. Mm. And when he first played me the Rose song before Bette recorded it, he said, you wait. He said, this will be a classic 20 years from now. Well, it's about, I think it's almost 30 years from now, 25 <laughs> years ago. And that song is still played all the time. So he was a master of what he did. So, all right. And um, uh at the moment, you're working on a documentary about Sophie Tucker, a jazz singer, comedian, and yeah. all-around interesting person from the first half of the 20th century. How is that coming along? It's finished. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Go to, anybody can go to sophietucker.com and learn more about it. Sophie Tucker, most people do here, most people these days don't know about her. I Sophie Tucker was the biggest, too. she was the biggest star in the world in the late teens and 1920s. The biggest star in the world, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people have heard of Al Jolson. Al yeah, Jolson, yeah. Is, he made the first talkie, the first mm -hmm. uh, sound movie. Well, Sophie Tucker was brought out to Hollywood to make the first female talkie. Mm -hmm. and she made it at Warner Brothers, was not a hit, did not do well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Sophie Tucker is a really an interesting piece of work. And she is the role model for the modern contemporary female performer. You know, we would not have these outspoken, you know, assertive confident, uh, um, funny women if it had not been for people like Sophie Tucker. You know, Bette Midler's daughter's name is Sophie. Mm. And Bette Midler for years did a thing in her act called The Soph. And it was a bunch of jokes based upon Sophie Tucker. And Sophie was basically an inspiration to people like Roseanne Barr mm. and, and, and uh, Bette Midler and, um, you know, a lot of the more um, funny comedic uh, singer performers out there all right well what's it called that that's very interesting and what's it called i'm afraid that's all we have the time we have for today but thank you so much mr gazeki for for um uh, what's it called coming on here it's it was a great honor and what's it called i feel we, i feel we all learned a bit like you having you on here you know just talking to you so thank you so much thank you dr no i'll talk to you later talk to you later bye bye, bye. Yeah, what's it called that? Um, uh, yeah, I had no idea that so that about I had no idea that Sophie Tucker lady existed until like yesterday when I was doing research. You know, it's so it's it called. I mean, it's just crazy we learn about. And like, I'm really surprised I never heard of her. It's just it's so weird. Like when you have somebody who was so influential.